So I'm uh, Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm head of Blue Stack Productions, the publisher of Irish Environment, an online magazine covering environmental matters on the island of Ireland. And I'm very happy today to be in Brussels at the offices of Client Earth uh, with Alan Andrews. Alan, you're very welcome. Thanks. Alan, now what's, what's your position with Client Earth? Uh, essentially, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, uh, and I head up our Clean Air program. <laughs> now, uh, could you tell the audience what Client Earth is and what it does in a kind of a general way? Sure. I mean, essentially, Client Earth is a, a not-for-profit environmental organization which really lo uses law as its main tool for, for defending the environment and protecting human health. And what, what percentage of the work that you do is actual litigation as opposed to other, pol I suppose, policy development mm. research? It, it might creep up closer to 50%, but yeah, a, a large portion of what we do is, is on the implementation side and also ensuring that the laws are coming out of, of Brussels mm -hmm. are actually fit for purpose and actually will protect human health and the environment. And what was, was there a triggering event that caused the foundation or led to the foundation of Client Earth? It was, it was really um, our founder and CEO, James Thornton, uh -huh. was, was in the UK. And I think it all came out of a meeting with, with, with his funders, the, the Macintosh Foundation, okay. who he was good friends with. Um, I think together they, they saw that there was a gap. They saw the public interest in environmental law, mm -hmm. which was very big in the US and North America, mm -hmm. was pretty much absent in, in the UK and Europe. First, I wonder if you could give us a sense of the kind of range of cases and areas in which the client earth uh, involves itself. Okay, well, um, we have program work in a range of environmental issues, um, everything from forests, um, marine biodiversity, um, toxic chemicals, climate and energy, and, and my own program, Clean Air. Um, we have litigation in, in some but not all of those those areas mm -hmm. um, a big early focus in our litigation was really around access to environmental information access to documents we have uh, the Aarhus Convention mm -hmm. which guarantees us rights to access environmental information and we've seen that both within member states like the UK um, and also within the European institutions the convention isn't applied and we don't get access to, to information that we're entitled to. So we, we had a, a big series of cases asking, requesting documents from European institutions uh, and that's also, uh, they're also tools that we use quite heavily in our program areas. Now let's, let's go to your, your, your in charge of the Healthy Air campaign and, um, and what's the primary uh, problem that you've identified that, that, that you're addressing through that campaign? Client Earth has has managed to bring together a, a pretty wide coalition of other organizations who are concerned about air pollution. Um, we wanted to reach a broader audience than maybe we'd traditionally be able to reach uh, just by the usual environmental channels. Mm -hmm. So we now have not just environment groups, but big health charities, Asthma UK, mm -hmm. the British Heart Foundation, the British Lung Foundation, mm -hmm. um, they're on board along with some big transport groups like Sustrans and Living Streets. Mm -hmm. So we have this real sort of broad coalition of, of groups concerned about air pollution. Um, um, our main problem is air pollution is one of the biggest public health problems in the UK and, and Europe. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it just doesn't get the recognition. It doesn't have the, the profile that it should, mm -hmm. given the number of people who, who die or are made sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just to use some statistics, it's thought that air pollution contributes to at least 29,000 early deaths each year in the UK. For the EU, it's something like 420,000. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very conservative figure, and we're expecting that some work that's being done at the moment could result in that figure doubling. Mm -hmm. So it's really... You know, second only to smoking in terms of environmental health risks. We're also doing a lot of work around the um, the warnings, public health warnings that we receive on air quality. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite striking that despite the, the clear impact on human health, mm -hmm. we get these regular air pollution episodes, smog episodes, if you will, mm -hmm. 
and you don't hear anything about it. The government has a, a legal duty to, to warn us when pollution is at dangerous levels, okay. yet all we see is a tiny little reference on an obscure government website. Okay. What we think is that we should be seeing air pollution warnings on the weather forecasts. Okay. Just you know, we, we see UV warnings, we see pollen warnings. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we but see air quality warnings? Now, let's, let's go to the, um, the important decision recently... Uh, reached in the European court um, on the nitrogen dioxide litigation uh, mm. by Client Earth against DEFRA. Sure. I mean, in a nutshell, <coughs> the case concerns breaches of EU air quality standards in towns and cities throughout the UK. Mm -hmm. <coughs> in this case, we're worried about nitrogen dioxide. That's a, a harmful gas produced by combustion at high temperatures. Its main source in the UK and much of Europe is diesel exhaust fumes. So diesel transport is the big the big problem. Mm -hmm. We brought the case back in 2011 because we saw that the nitrogen dioxide limits were being breached uh, in towns and cities up and down the country and the government plans showed that they weren't going to comply with those limits until after 2015. These are limits under the uh EU Air Directive. That's right. It's the the two thousand and eight Ambient Air Quality Directive. Okay. It sets it sets legally binding limits okay. for levels of air pollution in ambient air, and it also requires that where those limits are breached, the competent authorities in member states have to take action. Mm -hmm. They have to come up with a plan showing how they're going to get the problem solved. The the court decision in uh, in the European Court talks about limit values and target values. I wonder mm. if you could explain the difference in which those is more enforceable or stricter. Sure. Um, so under the Ambient Air Quality Directive, there are various types of objectives, mm. some very strict and, and binding, others uh, more aspirational, a bit softer. Mm -hmm. uh, limit values are a very strict objective. Mm -hmm. uh, under the directive that the language is that limit values are to be attained within a certain period mm -hmm. and not to be exceeded once it, once attained. Mm -hmm. And there is a long line of European court case law which makes clear that limit values Im impose an absolute duty. It's a, it's a duty result. You have to meet the limit by the deadline, mm -hmm. no ifs, no buts, no maybes. Uh, by contrast, um, there are target values uh, for example, in relation to ozone mm -hmm. and PM 2.5. The, the duties around target values is expressed as member states shall ensure um, they take all appropriate measures not entailing disproportionate cost okay. to achieve target values. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have that qualification with limit values. Okay. <clears throat> and that's one of the key issues is in our case was that it was clear that DEFRA were, were really looking at the nitrogen dioxide limits uh -huh. as mere targets. Uh -huh. and, and DEFRA is the Department of, of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And so the UK is not meeting the nitrogen dioxide limit values for 16 of 43 areas? Well, it was, it, yeah, originally our case concerned 16 zones that weren't going to meet the standards um, by 2015 uh -huh. and had failed to meet the standard by the original deadline of okay. 2010. What's interesting is that as the case has, has gone on for several years now, um, more and more evidence has come around showing that the initial projections were actually over-optimistic. Uh -huh. And so far from it just being 16 zones, uh -huh. it's actually the vast majority won't achieve compliance in 2015. Uh -huh. So while our case at the moment mm -hmm. only relates to those 16, it really has implications for pretty much every town and city in the UK. Yeah. As I said, it's then grown from these 16 zones to, <laughs> to pretty much the whole of the UK. Yeah. And then when the case was eventually f referred to the European Court, all of a sudden it has implications for the whole of the EU and not just the UK. So yeah, it's, it's, it's grown and grown. All right, let's, let's step back a little bit uh, to see how this mm. progressed through the UK courts. If, if, as I understand, the, the, if you don't meet the requirements by 2010, mm. then you can get a five-year extension if you show it in the shortest time possible, the implication being shortest time possible before 2015. Rather this, than beyond that, correct? The, I mean, this this was the key issue. Unfortunately, the, uh -huh. the, the two provisions of the directive uh -huh. 
don't really speak to each other all okay. that well. Okay. Um, okay. So it was unclear, at least to the to the UK Supreme Court, uh -huh. what does as short as possible mean. In our view, it's very clear: as short as possible cannot mean any later than 2015. Right. Okay. Otherwise, that would be simply absurd. You could right. just simply comply much later, not apply for a time extension, and, yeah. and just you know, hundreds of thousands of people can can die each year, yeah. and and there's no consequence. Now, what what was the High Court's decision? So essentially, Defra said, we're not applying for a time extension. These plans are our way of showing to the Commission mm -hmm. what we're trying to do to achieve compliance in the shortest time possible. Mm -hmm. If the Commission have any problem with that, they can bring infringement action. They can bring their own case against us. Mm -hmm. But it's not for the UK courts to intervene. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the High Court accepted that. Mm -hmm. They said there was no obligation on the government to apply for a time extension, so they could do as they had done and, and just submit these as soon as possible plans. Mm -hmm. We then had to apply to the Court of Appeal for permission uh -huh. uh, to appeal. Uh -huh. um, we were given that in 2012, uh -huh. so we had a, a hearing before the Court of Appeal. For us, the judgment of the High Court was didn't take any real account of EU law. Mm -hmm. The idea that the Commission is solely responsible for enforcing compliance with EU directives, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, is a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the application of EU law. Mm -hmm. It's very well established that national courts are obliged to apply EU law mm -hmm. and, and uphold rights conferred by it on, on UK citizens. Mm -hmm. So we were very disappointed, thought we'd really get somewhere with the Court of Appeal, mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately <laughs> we <laughs> the appeal was dismissed uh, within I think two hours. <laughs> so, uh, we were, we were it was done a it. quick death anyway. It was, yeah. a, it was a very quick death. That was yeah. the only thing, good thing you yeah. could say about it. And uh, yeah, we were done and dusted by lunchtime. Okay. They just <laughs> blew it off on, based on the High Court's decision. They, they listened to our barrister's arguments. Uh, um, they didn't even listen to the, the UK government's <laughs> lawyer, <laughs> which is a bad sign. Yeah. So we, we then applied to the UK Supreme Court in mm. 2013. Now, the Supreme Court only hears the most important cases. Mm -hmm. It will only hear cases which are of major constitutional importance mm -hmm. or which affect all or the majority of the population of the country. Mm -hmm. So there was some hope, just they're granting the application. Yeah, we, we, yeah. Th we, we felt at least we would get um, a good hearing. Uh -huh. And did and, you? And we did, yeah. yeah. We, had a, we felt we had a, a good day in court. Mm -hmm. um, our barrister, Dinah Rose QC, um, performed brilliantly mm -hmm. and we just got a sense from the judges that they were very unhappy with the idea that as the UK Supreme Court they had no role to play mm -hmm. in, in enforcing compliance mm -hmm. uh, and they were clearly somewhat baffled by the directive um, mm -hmm. so clearly wanted some guidance from the European Court on, on how they should apply it so the, the UK Supreme Court could have ruled on its own interpreting the uh, directive from the EU, right? They, they Absolutely. If, if, if they had felt the, the directive was clear enough, uh -huh. they, they could have made their own ruling. So now what happens in the, uh, what's the decision then at the European Court? So the European Court was essentially ruling on four questions which were referred to it by the UK Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Um, the first two questions essentially asked, is it mandatory to apply for a time extension where a member state has failed to comply with the limits <coughs> by the 2010 deadline? Mm. The that's UK, a, that's the UK. an easy question, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a very simple answer. Yeah. Um, the third question was, what does the directive mean mm -hmm. when it says that member states must come up with a plan containing appropriate measures to keep the exceedance period as short as possible. Okay. What does is, what is as short as possible mean? Uh -huh. Does it mean sometime before 2015, which was our original case? Mm -hmm. Or does it mean sometime after 2030, which mm -hmm. is what the, the government is currently projecting? Uh -huh. And then finally, um, I suppose the most interesting constitutional question was, 
what's the role of national courts? If a member state is in breach mm-hmm. of the limits and has failed to apply for a time extension, what's the role of the national courts? But what was their answer on the third question about the um, meaning of that term, short as possible time? Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> on the third question, the, the court seems to have misunderstood the question that uh-huh. was referred to it. Uh-huh. That, they seem to think that the UK was still arguing that it wasn't in breach of the directive because it had come up with this plan uh-huh. to show compliance in the shortest time uh-huh. possible. Okay. Now, that okay. issue was actually sorted out in the High Court. Mm-hmm. Um, the high, in the High Court, the government were forced to concede, OK, we're, we're in breach of the directive, we failed to comply with mm-hmm. the limits by the deadline and we don't have a time extension. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that issue was resolved in the High Court, and in fact the Supreme Court gave a formal declaration that that was the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's a shame that the, the European Court misunderstood the question. Okay. So as a result, they've not really elaborated on what as short as possible means. They've simply said, you must come up with a plan showing compliance as short as possible. Okay. Uh, so it's really going to come back to the national courts, and they will they will have to determine w- what that really means. Mm-hmm. But but I think the European Court has given some pretty big clues mm-hmm. as to how national courts should should be approaching that question. Okay. So for example, <clears throat> in the High Court, uh, one of the reasons given for, for not giving as a remedy was that the judges were concerned that. To do so would involve difficult political and economic choices, which it wasn't the job of the the courts mm-hmm. to get involved with. Mm-hmm. The European Court has has basically said that's not relevant here. Mm-hmm. They they would have the, the the national courts should have made an order regardless of cost or political difficulty. Mm-hmm. So if you if you if you carry the logic through from other parts of the judgment to this question of mm-hmm. as short as possible. I think you get to a fairly literal translation of those words. I think there's a good chance the government will come out with some new plans. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll be subject to public consultation. Uh-huh. Eventually, they're going to be subject to judicial scrutiny. But before that, they're going to be subject to media, public, and political scrutiny, mm-hmm. um, which <clears throat> is at a much more heightened level yes. than, than it was two or three years ago. We're all going to get to take a look at them, mm-hmm. and then that's the opportunity for for Client Earth, but also our Healthy Air campaign partners, mm-hmm. um, industry, academics, mm. you know, anyone who has some ideas on this issue. Okay. Now's the time. What we've done through the litigation is really create the space. We've generated the political will, uh-huh. um, so now there is that space for the for the, the technical solutions and other solutions like increased walking and cycling mm-hmm. to really come to the table. And you have the hammer of the European Court decision, which Absolutely. is always very helpful. Okay. And, and, and as you said, this is a ruling that applies not just to the UK, but throughout the yeah. EU, in yeah. terms of that requirement for a plan in short as right. possible time. Yeah, and, and that's, that's hugely significant because, yeah. yes, the, the, the limits are, are mm. breached in the UK, but they are in, in lots of other member states as well. Yeah. Um, something like mm. 17 member states are similarly in breach of the NO2 limits, okay. uh, with a similar number still in breach of PM10 limits, okay. which have been enforced since 2005. <clears throat> uh, uh, so, th- so the implications mm. of this judgment could be huge um, in driving forward action throughout the EU. In the meantime, the, uh, the focus will be on the European Commission. Mm-hmm. So, um, mainly as, as a result of the Client Earth case, uh, as a result of the UK Supreme Court declaring the UK was in breach, the European Commission decided that it, it had to actually step up and, and bring its own case. So now we have two cases operating in, in parallel against uh-huh. the UK, one brought by Client Earth, uh-huh. one brought by the Commission. Um, so uh-huh. it'll be interesting to see what the commission does in the coming months, but okay. I, I, I think we might see some movement there as well. Well, the High Court actually invited them, didn't they? To <laughs> absolutely, and they, uh, and they, they took up they, the invitation. They accepted the invitation. <laughs> Terrific, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alan. Thanks for talking to us today. No Appreciate problem. it.